Hi, my name is Aaron Lacey, and you are listening to Formal Complaints of Title IX Sexual Harassment, which is part of the Thompson-Coburn uh, Title IX training series. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Thompson-Coburn is a law firm in the Midwest, and we have offices uh, all over the place, coast to coast. We're pretty big, and we have a higher education practice. We have attorneys who spend uh, the great majority of their time working with colleges and universities on a wide range of issues, including those involving discrimination law, uh, like discrimination on the basis of sex, which is covered, of course, by Title IX. Uh, the purpose of this training, and uh, if you watch the first module, you know um, already that there is a new Title IX rule and it becomes effective August 14th, 2020. Uh, it's July 2020 right now. We are still operating amidst the pandemic. Uh, all of the speakers uh, in this training series are, are in home offices or other offices, but we're apart. And we know that for institutions trying to comply with these training requirements, uh, that's going to be a challenge because similarly, they are spread around right now. Some can't get into the office. And there's still a lot of questions about what's going to happen with students, et cetera, in the fall. So getting up on these training requirements is a challenge, and we wanted to try to make that a little bit easier. Um, the purpose of this particular series is to serve as foundational training for the individuals who are going to start taking part in the sort of revised and expanded uh, formal complaint process that we anticipate many institutions are going to have to put into place uh, or will put into place. And, and actually, it's the formal complaint process that is really the focus of this presentation and will be talked about uh, uh, greatly in the subsequent presentations as well. So we hope you find it useful. Um, if you do find it useful, please feel free to post it on your website. One of the sort of wrinkles of this new uh, rule, Title IX rule, is that institutions not only have to train their adjudicators and advisors uh, and appeal officers, but any training they use, they have to make available on their external websites. We are completely okay with that. This uh, training series was designed for that purpose. So please feel free to do that. And if you'd like custom training, meaning on your policy or simulations of hearings, things like that, we'd be happy to work with you to do that kind of thing as well. Um, the series is comprised of six modules. You are listening to the second of six, which again is sort of the introduction. We gave an overview of Title IX and the new rule in the last module. This module, we get a little more focused on the formal complaint process. And then in the subsequent four modules, we'll really start digging in to um, hearings and appeals and some of these significant elements of the new process. This is the syllabus for the, today's presentation. And if you listen to all six, you'll know that uh, it is frequently the case that the syllabus for a presentation is much longer than this. So you're in luck. Today's presentation is probably one of the shorter and more succinct ones. And uh, we'll try to make sure that we keep it as such. Um, joining me today, and you will see his face throughout all of the Title IX training series, is uh, Mr. Scott Goldschmidt, my friend and colleague. Scott is the former Deputy General Counsel at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., and while there, spent a great deal of time working on a variety of Title IX matters and other matters, uh, as is often the case with the General Counsel. Um, or general counsel's office, I should say. So the first stop on our syllabus today, the formal complaint framework. And as I mentioned in the first session, we talked about the new uh, rule, but we even took a step back and talked a little more about the Title IX statute. I wanna start there again. I'm a top-down learner and I always like to sort of start big and work our way into the details. So as I mentioned in the prior uh, session, and you'll hear me say again later uh, in subsequent sessions, keep in mind the Title IX statute created back in 1972 prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex um, in all forms and manners at institutions of higher education. So the point here is the Title IX statute doesn't merely prohibit sexual harassment, it prohibits any kind of activity that would be uh, uh, potentially discrimination on the basis of sex. So that would include discrimination in athletics, discrimination in uh, uh, potentially in housing or recruiting, anything along those lines. Um, and it's also important to note it covers both students and employees. So the statute itself is broad. Now, as often the case, uh, Congress created a statute that's broad but doesn't have a lot of meat on the bones. It essentially just includes the prohibition, and they asked the U.S. Department of Education then to step in and create a rule. Well, they did that, um, and that was back in 1975, and it covered a lot of ground, and as uh, uh, regulatory agencies are want to do. It expanded and articulated more around what the expectation was for the regulated community. So specifically, institutions of higher education, among other things, have to have a non-discrimination statement. Uh, they have to have a Title IX coordinator. They have to have processes in place for managing all forms or all complaints of uh, discrimination on the basis of sex, including sexual harassment. Uh, and then finally, they have to be on the lookout for uh, allegations of sexual harassment or discrimination 
on the basis of sex and be prepared to try to address it and remediate it and prevent it. Um, if you're interested in seeing the new rule, by the way, it's in the Federal Register uh, and you can click on this uh, link if you have the actual slides, which should be available somewhere near where these videos are posted. Um, this graphic uh, we include in all the sessions. And again, it's our way of really trying to help you wrap your brain around um, where the new rule fits into the overall Title IX framework. So as I mentioned, the statute prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex broadly in programs and activities offered by institutions of higher education. Again, athletics, housing, recruiting, uh, admissions, you name it. Now, the new rule is focused a little more specifically on what they call Title IX sexual harassment. And in the last session, Scott talked uh, in some detail about that definition of sexual harassment that's been introduced. But the real bulk of the new rule is the machinery that institutions have to put into place when they have a formal complaint of Title IX sexual harassment. And that's what you see here in the orange box at the bottom of the screen. And that's what we're really talking about today. We're going to get into what's required when you have a formal complaint. Now, before we go down that road, we should talk about what is a formal complaint. Uh, a formal complaint of Title IX sexual harassment, as defined in the new rule, is a written complaint. It could be electronic, doesn't have to be on an actual piece of paper, but it has to be in writing and it has to be signed either by a complaint or a Title IX coordinator, right? It's a written complaint to the institution alleging Title IX sexual harassment and requesting that the institution investigate. So if you get one of those, that's the point at which the institution has to initiate its process for managing formal complaints, and that process is, uh, has to comply with the new rule and with a lot of uh, very specific and detailed uh, elements, or has to include a lot of specific and detailed elements. Um, and here, I think this may be the first time you see this graphic in the series. You'll see it in the subsequent presentations. We sort of break out for you, categorically speaking, uh, each of the major elements that has to go into this formal complaint process. And the first three, the ones that are in orange, are the one we're, ones we're going to talk about today. So the department, when it set out the new rule, it talked about, and you'll see here, determinations and hearings and notice of allegations, but it started the whole thing uh, by offering up what it called sort of basic requirements for any formal complaint process. So today, uh, we call them the core requirements. That's what Scott is going to walk you through in the very next element of the uh, syllabus. And then we'll also spend a little time today talking about grounds for dismissal, which is important because there are circumstances where you have to dismiss a Title IX complaint under the new rule, a formal complaint. Um, and also we'll talk about complaint consolidation, which is equally important. And I know a lot of institutions, it is not uncommon that you may get two or three complaints at once that all relate to sort of one incident uh, or issue. And being able to consolidate those complaints is important. And it is something that the new rule contemplate. So with all of that having been said, Mr. Goldschmidt, thank you for standing by while I, while I got through the introductory pitch here. Uh, please walk us through these core requirements. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that explanation, Aaron. I think that kind of set the table nicely. Um, and it's, again, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Uh, so uh, as Aaron discussed, the, um, the new Title IX rule sets out the process for formal complaints of sexual harassment. And in that, they, they have requirements for their grievance procedure. Uh, in, the, in the regulation, they call it 10 basic requirements or the basic requirements for a, a grievance procedure for a formal complaint of sexual harassment. Um, you, here we call them the core requirements and, and we'll go through them one by one. Uh, so the first one is equitable treatment. Uh, and this is a, is a piece, again, if you, if you listen to the presentation, you'll hear us talk about a number of times. Um, but one of the, the department's big goals for this regulation is the equitable treatment of both complainants and respondents. And here they say equitable treatment uh, means a few things. Um, so first, if a complainant uh, files a formal complaint of sexual harassment and a determination is made where the respondent is responsible for sexual harassment, you have to provide remedies for that complainant. And those remedies must be designed to restore or preserve the equal access of the complainant to the school's educational program or activity. In addition, you need to follow um, a complaint process that complies with this rule. So in addition to these 10 requirements we're going to talk about now, uh, the rule, as, as Aaron mentioned on a previous slide, has a number of other requirements uh, that, that schools must comply with. And, and by doing that is an element of treating both parties equally. Um, second uh, basic requirement here is objective evaluation. 
And objective evaluation is something we really go into detail uh, in the uh, investigations and hearings module. Uh, but just as, as a little preview to, 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 to introduce the concept, uh, the school's formal complaint process must require objective evaluation of all evidence. Uh, so basically, an objective evaluation, as we mentioned here, is one that involves impartial consideration of available evidence, not prejudging a party based on their status as a witness or complainant or respondent, and no prejudgment of facts at issue. Um, and then when you're in uh, the, uh, the, the hearing process and you're a decision maker, um, not providing any deference to the recommendations of an investigator to really kind of, the investigator has their objective evaluation of the facts and provides a report. And you as a decision maker, if you're in that role, uh, provide your objective evaluation of the facts. Um, and as part of this process, uh, schools also have to provide that credibility determinations can't be based on a person's status as a complainant, respondent, or a witness. So really that means to the extent that that someone thinks respondents may more be more likely to have be, be responsible or vice versa, like that is absolutely not allowed. All facts, all evidence need to be treated objectively and based on uh, based on what you have in front of you. And Scott, I'll I'll jump in. You made a sort of an offhand comment there, but I think it is a really important one to emphasize, and that is. Um, you know, these requirements, which by the way, I, I think the reason we called them core requirements is we felt like they weren't very basic. <laughs> and candidly, that was a little misleading. Some of them are, are pretty complicated to wrap the mind around. Um, but the point you made that I think is a good one is uh, a lot of these core requirements, um, the department sort of lays them out in the law and says, well, you have to have these things. But then when we get into, as you noted, hearings and uh, investigations and some of these other components, they revisit these ideas and provide more information around what they really mean when they say you have to uh, be objective or you have to avoid conflict of interest or you have to make credibility determinations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just want to highlight for folks, we are going to talk about and really dig into some of those ideas at length when we are in our modules on investigation and hearings and appeals. So we're really setting the table for you here, but uh, keep in mind if you're an adjudicator and investigator and you're thinking, boy, this seems like a really hard concept, um, some of the later sessions are gonna dig into these ideas in more detail. And, and I'm glad to say we've got some experts, some career investigator in one case and a, and a longtime judge who are gonna talk about these ideas of being objective and relevance and things of that nature. Thanks, Aaron. That's a great point. Um, and, and actually, that brings us nicely to the next slide, in which we kind of get a little more preview into what a credibility determination is. Uh, so on the previous slide, we mentioned um, you, you can't make credibility determinations based on a person's status in the hearing. Uh, and just to introduce the concept briefly, uh, credibility determinations are, are what statements to believe in and what statements not to believe. So as an adjudicator, uh, you can believe everything a party says or a witness says, part of what they say, or none of it. And, and I think the, 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 the basis of how to make that um, determination, uh, I think as Aaron mentioned, we'll go into in a little more depth, but suffice it to say for here, um, in some situations, there, there really may not be much else to go on uh, besides uh, the, the statements of the parties. Um, so it really might come down to a credibility determination uh, in, in in, um, in large part to make a determination. So it is a very important concept and one that you should be thinking about as we uh, move forward in these training modules. Next, uh, oh, perfect segues, uh, training of, of key participants here. Um, so the rule requires um, training to be given for certain individuals um, throughout the, uh, uh, in, that, that are performing certain Title IX roles. So you have to have a process that includes training for coordinators, investigators, and adjudicators, and require that they be free of conflict of interest or bias. Um, so the materials here used to train Title IX coordinators uh, and Title IX personnel can't rely on sex stereotypes and must promote impartial investigations and adjudications of all formal complaints of sexual harassment. And here's a slide that lays out the, the training of, of key participants uh, and kind of broken down of, of what has to be trained for each. Um, so as mentioned here, there's, there's uh, the, the Title IX personnel are, are broken down um, and, and what the, the rule requires that they be trained on. Um, obviously this is not a, this is a floor, not a ceiling of what they could be trained on, but you have to make sure that 
before uh, the rule goes into effect, this training does take place um, for each of these Title IX participants. Yeah, and it's worth, you, you said it, but it's worth emphasizing that um, what you see on this slide and you'll see on the next slide, I think, are, uh, are in the actual rule. So uh, as Scott noted, you know, while there are a lot of different types of training that you may want uh, different folks at the institution to it, it go through, again, advisors, uh, adjudicators, hearing officers, appeal officers, um, you have to make sure that they're getting these things. So if you are, for example, devising a training checklist, you wanna make sure that the things that are required in the rule are at the top of that checklist. Or if you are evaluating the combination of training materials that are on your external website, uh, again, if you're being audited, if OCR is looking to make sure that you have the requisite training elements in place, you know, you're gonna to wanna to look across those materials on your website and make sure that the things you see on this slide are specifically being addressed. Everything else, um, and there may be a lot of other things that are very important. We mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we think simulations are great uh, when you have folks who are gonna be a hearing officer, giving them the opportunity to go through a mock hearing is so, so valuable. Uh, similarly, investigators can benefit from that kind of exercise. But as Scott noted, the floor is making sure that you are training your individuals who are gonna serve in these roles on these specific items at, at a minimum. And you need to be able to document that you're doing it and you need to show the materials you're using to do it on your external website. So I just wanna emphasize that this is not our opinion of what would be great training. Um, this is what the rule actually requires for the people who are in these roles. Yeah, no, all great points. Um, and let me let me pose a question to you in the next slide, Aaron. So we talked about the, the, the training that, um, that has to occur and you might wanna uh, include more training than that. Um, but from your experience, uh, what, what are some best practices to, uh, to, to train individuals, especially in light of the, the COVID-19 challenges that we're all facing right now? Yeah, I, great question. So I'll start by saying, I think sometimes when institutions certainly in the past have been faced with this idea of, you know, we're supposed to have Title IX training and you have similar training requirements that are present under the Clery Act that, that may overlap and require some of that same type of content to be delivered. Um, you know, I'll talk with the institution and they'll say, well, we, we purchased this product, this video on bystander intervention from this uh, third party, which is great. And it's a great video. We love it. And then we're doing this other thing and that's our training. And one of the things I really try to encourage institutions to do, and I think the new rule to some extent is going to force them to do that, is to think more broadly about all the specific constituents that you're looking to train or the particular folks, you know, so you've got students and you have the things you want to train students on, you know, your policies around sexual misconduct, um, bystander intervention, things of that nature, where they can go if they experience an issue. And a lot of those things you're going to want to train employees on as well. But when you're talking about training for advisors and investigators and Title IX coordinators, uh, these aren't folks um, that need general training and awareness around your policies. These are folks who need specific training with regard to the roles they're going to play. So now you're talking about policy training and training on the law and this type of foundational training. So, you know, my, my recommendation to folks is you really should have a training plan and you should say, who are our target audiences and what is the type of training that we need sort of categorically for each of these audiences and then think about how we're going to deliver that. You don't have to deliver it the same way every year. You might have a speaker come in one year to do your policy training and you could have someone do a video a subsequent year. Some types of training like these foundational series could just be posted on your website and everybody can review them until the law changes, they ought to stay fresh. On the other hand, you're gonna have certain kinds of training that you wanna update every year. And it, and it probably is good to have folks um, uh, on campus and going through live simulations and things like that. So I would develop that training plan, understand that it can change over time. That's something your Title IX coordinator can probably take the lead on. Um, look at different types of resources. I actually think for the folks receiving training, when you are getting some variety, that's helpful. If everything is just sitting in front of a computer, uh, it can become stale pretty quickly. So having some live interactions, some web-based uh, uh, concepts where there's a platform, but there's an engagement in the platform, and then occasionally having the lecture type things like these, these training modules combining all of that in a meaningful way to make sure that all of your constituents are getting the training they need, it's important. So I really encourage your Todd Nine coordinator and whoever else is sort of in, it might be, uh, have these types of responsibilities to sit down and in a deliberate way, develop a training plan. I can also tell you, 
when the Office of Civil Rights or any other auditor that might come around, boy, if you could pull that out and, and you keep a record of it as the training, you know, what's the training we've made available year over year and you document that you've gone through this process of assessing your plan. Um, I mean, that all looks great and it shows and demonstrates that you are serious about Title IX and Clary Act compliance and that you're approaching it in a meaningful uh, and deliberate way. A couple other bullets here. Encourage and ensure time for questions when possible. So obviously there are no questions when you have a lecture style pre-recorded uh, training session like the one we're doing right now, but it is important. And this goes back to my comment about, you know, mixing it up. You want to make sure that some of your training plan includes modules or programs where folks can really engage. And that's why we like the simulations, for example, because it's an, it's an excellent opportunity for uh, a would-be uh, adjudicator or investigator to stop amidst the simulation and start asking questions to folks who can give meaningful feedback. Um, and then finally, we've, we've sort of hit on this, uh, consider uh, mixing up with lots of live programs and events and things of that nature. So it's a big job, but it's an important one. And I, my experience has been that schools often spend a lot of time, uh, and I understand why this is, resource constraints, all kinds of things. But um, schools, I think, invest a lot of time in figuring out how they're going to address serious issues, um, meaning their sort of complaint process, et cetera, and maybe a little less time and, and have more trouble convincing the powers that be to allocate resources to preventative efforts like upfront training. But boy, is it important. And it really will help you on the back end too, to demonstrate compliance, whether that's to OCR or in, a, in, a, in front of a jury or anything along those lines. Yeah, that, that's all great points. And I think uh, just to, to piggyback on that, from my experience, the, the, the simulations too certainly are, are, are where the, the rubber hits the road and where you really see who understands concepts and who does not. Um, but moving right along, um, so we've hit three of our, our core 10. Uh, the fourth is the presumption of, of innocence, so the presumption of non-responsibility for the responsible. Um, so here we, we included a, a site from, the, from both the, the regulation and the preamble, and um, just so everyone's on the same page, the preamble is the, the commentary that becomes prior to the regulation. And when you talk about the, um, the regulation scope, uh, the unofficial rule came out, it was 2,000 pages of preamble, and about 30 pages of, of, of rules. So the preamble is much more lengthy and really gives the, the department's thinking and understanding um, of, uh, of the provisions in the regulation. And that helps us really understand kind of how they are going to interpret. Um, so here the department comes out and says, uh, the presumption of non-responsibility doesn't mean the harassment didn't occur. It just ensures that there's no prejudgment of facts prior to the fact that a determination is made. Um, so here, this, this kind of goes to um, the, the burden of proof that we'll talk about a little later. It's not the respondent's um, responsibility to, to prove their innocence. Here, the, there's no, there's, there's no uh, responsibility until an ultimate determination is made at the conclusion of a formal hearing process. Um, fifth out of our 10 is, is prompt timeframes. Um, so the regulations explain that the school's process must include reasonably prompt timeframes for resolution, which allow for temporary delay or limited extension for good cause. That's what the regulation says. The, the pieces and quotes here from the preamble to give a little more concept, context. And what the pre preamble explains is any timeframe um, included by the institution uh, is reasonably prompt, where uh, which is evaluated in the context of the, the, the institution's operation of an educational program or activity. So what that means potentially is the, there's a difference between reasonably prompt for a corporation that operates 365 days a year and a school that might have breaks or, or certain things. Um, so that is, uh, you're able to, to take that into account when you're determining what you consider in your process as, as reasonably prompt and, and what kind of would, would, would come when you have a, a situation that potentially occurs uh, during a break. Second, um, the department says that it's, it's to the, the institution's idea to, to balance um, promptness with fairness. Uh, so there are certain situations, again, we'll talk about a little later. So when a, when a police uh, concurrent law enforcement investigation comes into play, um, there could be a reasonably prompt, uh, there could be good cause for a delay if the police investigation lets you know in two weeks, we're going to come out with this evidence that we think might be helpful for your investigation. That, that could be a reason for a delay. Whereas if 
police say, we're pursuing a rape kit, but it's not available for a year or two, that might not. And that's up for you to decide um, based on the facts and circumstances of your case. Uh, number six, moving right along, are, are sanctions and, and remedies here. So the, the school's formal complaint process must end, uh, describe the range of possible sanctions and remedies. Uh, and the preamble explains uh, sanctions and remedies are left to the, the sound discretion of the, the institution. So in your, in your sound discretion, you can, you can determine. And these are things you probably have been already doing um, throughout anything from educational reflections, all the way to suspensions, to expulsions. These are all the, the realms here. Um, and then the new regulations also permit recipients to evaluate such considerations and make disciplinary decisions uh, that each recipient believes are in the best interests of, of their educational environment. So take a thoughtful approach here, but the, regu the, the preamble is explaining that it's, it's, it's left in school's discretions uh, and what, what is in the best interests of, of your particular educational environment. Next, uh, again, uh, something we'll preview here that we'll get into a lot more depth uh, in, in future presentations, um, but the school's process must detail the standard of evidence that will be used uh, consistently for all formal complaints of sexual harassment. So just to the extent that you have a, a formal complaint process of sexual harassment in a, in a different context, in, a, in an employment or a collective bargaining agreement context, uh, you would have to use the same standard for, for your, your Title IX sexual harassment process or change the standard there. Um, so schools can either use a preponderance standard, uh, which means that a particular fact or event was more likely than not to have occurred, or a clear and convincing evidence standard, which means that a particular fact or event was highly and, uh, and substantially more likely than not to have occurred. And schools have discretion here to choose um, which one works best for their educational environment, except that certain state laws um, mandate a standard. And if that's the case, then absolutely follow your state law. Next, um, appeal processes and standards. So your formal complaint process has to describe your appeal process and standard. So the regulations explain that there's three bases that you have to include for your appeals. A procedural irregularity that affected the outcome, new evidence not reasonably available at the time of the determination or dismissal that could affect the outcome, that could affect the outcome, and that the Title IX coordinator, investigator, or adjudicator had a conflict of interest or bias that affected the outcome of the matter. Um, schools have to offer these appeals uh, equally to both parties. Schools not limited to these three, they could add more, but you have to at least include uh, these three appeals um, at, 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 at a few different times during the uh, the formal complaint process. That's right. And, and folks don't know this, but we've already recorded some of the later sessions. We're not, we didn't record them all in order. And so we can go ahead and tell you in the session on appeals, uh, judge, uh, retired judge Booker Shaw will talk a lot about, uh, obviously appeal processes and in particular these bases for appeals and, uh, what schools should be thinking about. So we encourage you if you're an appeals officer or you're someone who's, you know, responsible, uh, for understanding the appeals process at your institution, boy, we encourage you to check out that module. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron. Um, and uh, I think we're almost done here with our 10. Um, so number nine uh, in our core requirements are supportive measures. So schools process must describe the range of available supportive measures. And here uh, hopefully is a list that should be relatively familiar to uh, individuals that have dealt with Title IX uh, previously. Um, but just to just to explain that these are these are the range of of supportive measures that, that you could um, potentially offer and include in, in your policy. That's right. And it doesn't, I, you know, I don't think there's anything in the rule that suggests, just to be clear, that your, your discussion of the range has to be exhaustive or comprehensive. I think it just has to be exemplary of the kinds of things that the school could offer. And this is a perfect example on the slide of the kinds of things you might include. Exactly. Uh, and last but not least is, is uh, legal privilege. So legal privileges, um, just to preview this, are, 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 are aspects that protect certain communications and documents from disclosure. Uh, your formal complaint process, and you need to make sure all, all your Title IX personnel know that you cannot require, allow, rely on, or otherwise use questions or evidence that constitute 
or seek disclosure of information protected under a legally recognized privilege. Uh, so some of those privileges uh, include uh, the attorney-client privilege, the priest penitent privilege, the doctor patient privilege, and the spousal privilege. And the individual that holds the privilege uh, is the one that um, can, can protect it, but also decide to waive it. So if that person has, has decided to waive that privilege, you are, you are able to, there's no restriction anymore on that information. But to the extent that they have not, you have, you have to make sure you understand your investigators and your hearing officers especially understand that this is not information that you'd be entitled to. And with that, I'll kick it over to Aaron for, for a topic about dismissal. Yeah, thank you, sir. Although I may lean back, Scott, I may lean back on you here because I know you know this particular topic extremely well. Um, so I interestingly enough, pursuant to the new rule, uh, institutions in certain circumstances are required to dismiss a formal complaint of Title IX sexual harassment. So you see here on the slide, schools must, and we draw this distinction because on the next slide, we're going to see a may. But here, schools must dismiss a formal complaint of sexual harassment for purposes of sexual harassment under Title IX. So what we're saying is you have to dismiss it and move it out from under your formal complaint process for Title IX sexual harassment in these circumstances. If the alleged conduct would not constitute sexual harassment, even if proved, did not occur in the school's education program or activity, did not occur against a person in the United States. And if you look back at the definition of sexual, Title IX sexual harassment that Scott discussed in the prior session, um, you'll see that essentially what the, what the department is saying here in the law is, if you have a, a formal complaint that's made and it fails to satisfy the core requirements of that definition of sexual harassment. In other words, if someone's complaining about something and it does not, by definition, doesn't constitute Title IX sexual harassment, then you have to dismiss it, right? But, and this is an extremely important point, and Scott and I talked in the prior session about, you know, institutions are gonna have to make decisions about how they wanna do all of this. Even if you dismiss a formal complaint of Title IX sexual harassment on the grounds that it doesn't constitute Title IX sexual harassment or doesn't satisfy these criteria, um, such a dismissal does not preclude action under another provision of the school's code of conduct. So in other words, you could say, well, we recognize and you know that, that this formal complaint of sexual harassment doesn't qualify as Title IX sexual harassment for one of these reasons, right? But so, so it, you know, we had a student who was studying abroad in another country. They're physically outside of the country, and that's where the incident occurred. It was on our campus location that's in that country. So now we have to decide how to proceed. We're going to dismiss it as a formal complaint of Title IX sexual harassment, but now we may decide to proceed under a separate policy that we have for managing formal complaints of non-Title IX sexual harassment, or as Scott mentioned in the prior module, you could also say, you know what, we're going to dismiss it as a Title IX complaint and we're going to put it under this separate policy, but this separate policy is actually identical. So the process we're going to use is the same. We're just acknowledging the department's regulation that this is no longer a formal Title IX complaint. Um, optional dismissal. So schools may dismiss a formal complaint of sexual harassment at any time if a complainant notifies a Title IX coordinator in writing that they would like to withdraw, the respondent is no longer enrolled or employed by the school, or specific circumstances prevent the school from gathering sufficient evidence to reach a determination. You know, we anticipate that a lot of institutions will be very, and we hope you would be very thoughtful about when you would exercise um, on a discretionary basis, uh, the opportunity to dismiss a formal complaint of sexual harassment. Because as a general matter under Title IX, and we know schools as a general matter, want to investigate these types of issues and bring them to a close to ensure that they don't occur again. Um, and or that a victim is uh, uh, provided appropriate remedies, right? But there could be circumstances, uh, practically speaking, where it becomes extremely difficult to proceed. Um, for example, if your complainant says, I want to withdraw the formal complaint, right? And I'm not going to cooperate any further. Uh, or, and I've been involved in these types of situations, and I'm sure if there are Title IX coordinators or counsel listening, you have as well, where you have a student or an employee who files a complaint, and then they sub subsequently depart the institution before you can complete the process. 
you may not be able to communicate with them. I've had situations where uh, inter international students who were on campus when the incident occurred uh, went back home and we couldn't communicate with them uh, or get in touch with them in any way. And the department seems to anticipate here that there could be circumstances where an institution maybe appropriately would say, we're gonna dismiss the formal complaint. By the way, the school could still it put into place supportive measures and take other steps. You're only dismissing the formal complaint concept and moving it out of this, you know, very specific machinery. But uh, again, there's still a lot of opportunity, even if someone's departed and you can't get in touch with the complainant or respondent, et cetera, um, to still try to try to uh, take steps that are appropriate. Um, again, upon a required or optional dismissal, schools must promptly and simultaneously send written notice to the parties. So to the extent, you know, if you have the situation where you can't find one of the parties, that may be a challenge. But nonetheless, the idea here is, and this is um, consistent with the overall theme in the new rule, and I'll say even more generally in proceedings, that you want to be sure to treat the parties equitably and to communicate them, communicate with them promptly and in an equitable way. Um, keep in mind when we talk about dismissal of complaints, the 10645 grievance process and the department here, this is a quote out of the Federal Register from the preamble or the commentary. Um, and 106.45, that's the formal complaint process in the law that we're talking about here and in subsequent presentations. So the department says this formal process obligates recipients to investigate and adjudicate allegations of sexual harassment under Title IX. Um, the department does not have authority to require recipients to investigate and adjudicate misconduct that's not covered under Title IX. So again, getting back to the discussion we had a minute ago, part of the basis or part of the justification the department has here for um, requiring dismissal of a formal Title IX complaint when those certain elements aren't satisfied is because in their view that it, it, those types of circumstances would exceed their jurisdiction. So they no longer have authority to require you to comply with Title IX in those circumstances. But again, it does not preclude an institution from handling misconduct that does not implicate Title IX in the manner that the recipient deems fit. And we anticipate that most, if not all institutions, will still uh, work aggressively to manage and address any complaint of sexual harassment or discrimination on the basis of sex that they may receive. Um, Scott, a couple of questions for you here. The first, uh, and I may have touched on some of these in my ramblings, must schools always investigate a formal complaint of sexual harassment? Uh, and I think the, the, the really succinct answer is yes. And it's very important for, for schools to kind of have this in mind. And that's, I think, the, the reason for such a direct question is whenever there's a formal complaint of sexual harassment, they're investigated, full stop. Even if, even if you ultimately dismiss it? Yes, because, you, I mean, to the extent that, that you need to, uh, to, to understand more about the situation to get to a dismissal of the situation, you want to document that, that you've, you've started it, you, you learned all the facts that you needed to. And if you get to a point where it's, it's clear from a very quick investigation that the, the person's outside the United States, then that's an easy, uh, you don't need to go much further than that. But, but you want to at least uh, make sure that you start the process um, and, and do that investigation. Right. And under what, under what circumstances uh, is a mandatory dismissal applied? Yeah, and I think this is one you did you did go over, um, and and again, it's 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 if it would not constitute sexual harassment even if proved. Um, so basically, if if uh, if you you read the complaint as true, and to the extent that even if every every sentence was true, it would not be Title IX sexual harassment. That's a mandatory dismissal. It didn't occur in the school's education program or activity, and that's a defined term that we go over. Uh, but to the extent that it's outside that that realm, it's not Title IX sexual harassment or it didn't occur against a person in the United States. Scott, if a school's required to dismiss a complaint, so they've, they've done the evaluation you just walked through and they determined we, under the law, we have to dismiss it. Uh, can it still investigate and adjudicate the complaint under alternative procedures? And I obviously spoke to this a little bit um, previously. So let me, let me recast the question just a little bit. Um, how do you anticipate schools will go about that? Do you think that uh, some will uh, have a totally separate process? Do you think that some will just proceed with the Title IX process, but without the Title IX in front? I know we addressed this a little bit in the first session, but I'm curious if you have any additional thoughts. I, I, think, I think that's... Um... That, that's that's going to be a really interesting uh, decision that schools have to make over the next 
uh, a few weeks to, 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 to determine how they're going to handle these, these complaints. I think the, the thing that I, they want to add and make clear is that there will certainly be incidents of sexual harassment that are not considered Title IX that the school absolutely needs to or should want to investigate and adjudicate. Um, so to the extent that you uh, kind of think through your, your processes, um, make sure that if you have a code of conduct process and you're adjudicating a Cleary offense, that it meets the Cleary requirements as well. Um, this process would meet the Cleary uh, requirements, so that could be a, a determination um, to, to, uh, for schools to consider. Um, but just it, it's a question of, of, of how much you, uh, you want to have uh, the burden of a potentially separate process versus the burden of kind of going through the, all the requirements required in this final regulation. All right, so we're on uh, to our last segment of the syllabus in record time uh, <laughs> compared to some of the other longer sessions. So Scott, um, tell us a little bit about the consolidation of formal complaints. Absolutely, and this is a really important concept and we, we only have this one slide on it. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time here, um, but the, the regulations permit that uh, if allegations of sexual harassment arise, out of the same facts and circumstances, so basically the, the same incident all around, you can consolidate formal complaints that are against more than one respondent by more than one complainant against more than one respondent and by one party against the other party. And this is a really important tool for, for schools to have, um, not for the, the kind of the, the more frequent um, one complainant, one respondent uh, sexual harassment that, that potentially might occur, but a situation where you have one um, complainant and, and five or six respondents, um, if you do not have this process, it would be very time intensive, very cumbersome to, to have six separate Title IX hearings essentially. So the fact that the, the rules allow this is, is, is important. It's something schools should take advantage of and schools should also start thinking about how this would occur um, kind of in practice because the, the, it's, it's a very different situation from the one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of generic, more, more traditional harassment to have these kind of complaints and things to think through logistically are spacing, where do you, where do you put everyone, especially if someone requires or requests um, a telecommunications option or separate rooms. Um, how do you do uh, your FERPA redactions when you provide investigative reports uh, to, to people and there's six different uh, kind of, uh, respondents listed all, all in those reports? And, and how do you ultimately manage uh, a situation where you could have three, four, five, six attorneys that are, that are uh, involved in, in trying to, to, to communicate? So this is, this is a, a good thought, but, but it, and, and it, and it could, should be used judiciously, but, but also worth thinking through uh, some of the mechanics so that if this does arise, um, you kind of have a, a place to start. So that brings us to our resources here at the end. So thank you, as always, Scott, for all your insight uh, and uh, detail. Um, I'll just let folks know briefly, and we've mentioned before, the Office of Civil Rights has a great blog, and it's also where they've indicated if they have guidance or uh, further comment on the new rule, this is where they're going to put it. You can click, if you have the slides, you can click here and you can actually go to um, the blog, or you can probably just Google Office for Civil Rights blog. Uh, we also, whoops, skipped a slide. We also have a uh, uh, comparison document that we created that should be located uh, on the same website uh, where you find the slides and, um, and link to the training materials, these sessions. At any rate, this comparison document shows what changes the new rule made to the existing uh, regulation at uh, part 106. So we, uh, if you're like me and you like to see that type of comparison to see where the changes really occurred, you may enjoy flipping through this document. We have a, a higher ed webinar series every year that begins in August and runs through May. And we invite you, uh, it's free, it's uh, on demand if you don't catch it the first time it airs. And if you are counsel or an attorney, most, I think 99% of the ones we've done over the last four or five years 
um, are all CLE certified. So if you happen to be counsel and you're looking to pick up CLE and, and uh, stick with higher ed topics, here is an opportunity for you to do so. Um, I'll also note, uh, let's see, that was the page where we have things on demand. We have a blog. We'd be happy for you to read this. We talk about a lot of higher ed regulatory and policy things on our Regucation blog. And finally, keep an eye out. Uh, we occasionally uh, create uh, tools for institutions of higher education. They are free. Again, here's an example. We did a bar defense rule reporting guide that um, talked about and helps institutions understand the reporting they need to make to the U.S. Department of Education under the new rule that became effective July 1 of this year, one of several, actually. Uh, and finally, uh, after this, you'll see extended bios for Scott and for me, and as well as our disclaimer, just reminding you that we are not your attorneys, uh, unless we are your attorneys. <laughs> but uh, typically, the idea is that we're not giving legal advice here. Uh, hey, thank you so much. We hope you found this session uh, helpful. Please be on the lookout for the others. Um, and uh, again, a lot of the things we talked about today, uh, relevance, credibility, uh, those types of sort of squishy concepts are explored in more depth in subsequent sessions. And we hope you'll check those out. That all having been said, take a deep breath, Aaron. Uh, we hope, uh, particularly in the midst of the pandemic, from Scott and from myself, uh, we'll just say to everyone, please be safe and be well, and we'll see you next time.